Good evening. My name is Nate Olson. I'm the Associate Director of the Kegley Institute of Ethics and an Assistant Professor of Philosophy here at CSUB. Um, the Kegley Institute's new director, Michael Burroughs, um, was scheduled to moderate the panel this evening. Uh, unfortunately, he came down with a case of pneumonia and is at home recuperating. <laughs> so he wanted me to express his regrets for not being able to make it tonight. Uh, I know that he is disappointed to not be able to be here. Uh, tonight's discussion topic is a hugely important one for Kern County. We have a fantastic group of panelists who will shed light on how people in Kern County are living in severe poverty and what we're doing about it. The touchstone for tonight's discussion is this year's One Book, One Bakersfield, One Kern selection, $2 a day, Living on Almost Nothing in America, by Catherine Eden and uh, Luke Schaefer. As many of you know, this is one in a series of events that are happening around Bakersfield related to this book. Um, and uh, we're going to have a particular focus this evening for it. Uh, the, the introduction to the book provides some sobering statistics. You might think that people living on $2 a day is something that only happens in other parts of the world. But one of the book authors did an analysis that found in early 2011, about 4% of families in the United States with children, so that's 1.5 million households with 3 million children in them, um, met, the, uh, met the criteria what they're talking about of living on $2 a day or less. Uh, the way that they count that, so it's thinking about any kind of income that comes into the household, anything that comes in as cash into the household counts. So they're talking about gifts from other people, income from jobs, and even considering all those sorts of things, it's still people living on $2 a day or less. Uh, one thing it doesn't count is federal benefits that aren't cash, so things like food stamps. Um, but even if you count that, um, so the number is cut in half, but we're still talking about 750,000 households in the United States with 1.5 million children. And as they note in the book, um, that number's been growing since the 1990s. The book is gripping, informative, and a pretty quick read, too. Um, I would highly recommend it if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet. It puts a human face on this poverty by profiling several people around the country who live on less than $2 a day. Um, it doesn't, however, profile anyone from Kern County or California. So that's where tonight's panel discussion comes in. Uh, before we get to it, I want to mention a couple of different upcoming events. So next Wednesday at 7 o'clock in the Icardo Center is when the two authors of the book are coming to campus. Uh, there'll be a discussion about the book, a book signing in the Icardo Center. That's next Wednesday, November 1st at 7 o'clock. Uh, and I also want to mention our next Kegley Institute uh, event is the following Wednesday on November 8th, where we'll have a panel discussion in the December reading room um, at 6 o'clock on the topic of free speech on campus. So we're going to be talking about what is free speech, uh, what are the limits of free speech, an important topic right now. Uh, that panel, I'll be moderating that panel again. I think Michael will be back in good health by that point. He'll be, uh, he will be, and uh, it's, uh, so that's a, a couple weeks from now. He'll be one of the panelists as well as two professors from political science. Uh, I'd also like before we start to thank our corporate sponsors of the Kegley Institute of Ethics whose support enables our events to happen. Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, a partnership between Kaiser Permanente and Adventist Health, and Chevron. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over, well, introduce our four panelists that we have here. So we have a wonderful panel this evening of four different people who are going to talk, to give us different perspectives on uh, the poverty, severe poverty in Kern County and what we're, what we're doing about it. So we're going to move in the kind of you're all left to right direction here. So first we have Brady Bernhardt, who's a community That was pretty good. Um, he's a community development specialist with the Community Action Partnership of Kern. He has degrees in geography and urban and regional planning with almost 20 years of experience as a certified planner and is a part-time lecturer of economics at CSUB. Brady is a current member of the Kern Food Policy Council, Kern County Human Relations Commission, City of Bakersfield Historic Preservation Commission, and works with one of the largest poverty-fighting nonprofit agencies in Central California, the Community Action Partnership of Kern. 
So next we have Della Hodson. She's president and CEO of the United Way of Kern County. She joined United Way in 2004 and served as director of community impact until her appointment as president in July 2008. During her tenure, she has overseen development of a number of financial stability and asset building programs for low to moderate income families or populations. A Bakersfield resident since 1993, Della has a background in journalism and public relations. She's a longtime volunteer and former board president with Habitat for Humanity Golden Empire and former board chair of the American Red Cross Kern Chapter. She currently serves on a number of community boards and advisory committees. Next, we have Deborah Johnson. <laughs> Deborah is the president and CEO of the California Veterans Assistance Foundation. She is an honorably discharged Wisconsin Army National Guard veteran uh, who served for over nine and a half years, including a deployment during Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm from 1990 to 1991, where she received the Army Commendation Medal, Southwest Asia Service Medal, and the Liberation of Kuwait Medal. She's been working with homeless veterans for over 20 years, first in Wisconsin and since 2009 with the California Veterans Assistance Foundation in Bakersfield. She was named president and CEO that year in 2009. She's active in several local organizations and is this year's recipient of the California Department of Veterans Affairs Trailblazer Award. Finally, we have Karen Urso. Karen is a registered nurse and public health nurse who has worked with those living in poverty for most of her career. A Bakersfield resident for the past 17 years, she earned a Master's of Science degree in nursing with an emphasis in community health nursing from CSU Bakersfield in 2008. That same year, she began teaching community health nursing, which she continues to do now on a full-time basis. She also worked for the Kern County Public Health Services Department for 11 years. She's a member of the Kern County Asthma Coalition and has participated in many community collaboratives. She learns from her patients in the community and she finds inspiration in their hope, strength, and ability to overcome through adversity. So you, as you can see, we have a fantastic panel. Um, I'm gonna give them time. They're gonna, as I've told each of them, they have up to 15 minutes to talk about, give some opening remarks. And then after that, we're gonna open it up for questions from you all. So that'll be the last 45 minutes or so of, of the evening tonight. So let me turn it over to Brady. Okay, <clears throat> so we're here to talk about the book, $2 a day, <clears throat> and the fight against poverty, which is something I've been doing for the last four years with Community Action Partnership of Kern. <clears throat> uh, before I get too far ahead, I'd like to read a brief passage from the book for those of you that may not have read it yet. It's a, it's a good read and, and you should pick it up and take a look at it. Uh, this section deals with a group of researchers that went into a person's home to evaluate how they live on $2 a day. And originally, they thought it would be a difficult task to find homes and, and families that live on $2 a day. But it turned out not to be, and they explain that in the book. So that's uh, one of the things that you'll see if you read through this. Numerous stories of families uh, and individuals that are living on $2 a day for whatever reason. But the unifying theme throughout this book, to me, is that everyone is willing to work, wants to work. They want a job. They want they want to, ha to make their life meaningful through work of some kind. So there is something positive. It's not a complete <laughs> you know, downer, so to speak. But this passage is, I thought, really impactful. Uh, and it talks about, at the, at the conclusion of the interview, the researchers gave the young mother the standard interview stipend of $50 in cash. When they returned to do follow-up interview just 24 hours later, they found that not only was their formula on the shelf, but Ashley had uh, permed and styled her hair because her hair had been in disarray when they met with her at first, <clears throat> and gone to the thrift store for a new outfit, leaving a baby with her mother 
Ashley was now on her way out the door in her new pantsuit to apply for jobs. Uh, the little bit of uh, autonomy that $50 had afforded Ashley had apparently sparked enough confidence in her to begin looking for work. So that's just a brief passage to give you an example of some of the work they were doing and what they found. Uh, okay, I'm not going to read the whole book. <laughs> <clears throat> so what we've been doing here in Kern County, uh, first we wanted to have a good understanding of the big picture nationwide so that we can drill down to what our issues are in Kern County. These are just a couple of examples of things that you'll see in the news uh, almost on a daily basis these days. On the left side, child poverty declined uh, for most racial and ethnic groups in 2016, but there's major disparities that are obvious. <clears throat> on the right side, you'll see the Economic Innovation Group, and what they've done is to, all right, I'll speak in here, but, all right. <laughs> what they've done is to uh, show us an average life expectancy chart uh, depicting uh, from the right to left, if you're in a distressed state, and they, they define this all the way through prosperous in the life expectancy that you can expect. So definite disparities uh, going on. There's a lot of research out there right now, and new research uh, virtually every month that comes out. On the left-hand side, you'll see our place on the world stage, uh, and from right to left, in this graph, it basically represents childhood poverty uh, on a worldwide scale with those countries listed. So we're in, by no means uh, at the lowest end of childhood poverty. <clears throat> On the right, you'll see that uh, childhood poverty, child poverty falls to record low. Comprehensive measures show strong government policies accounting for long-term improvements. And a couple of quotes that I thought were impactful uh, from a recent uh, webinar that I attended on, on new data coming out. Now, the first one deals with behavioral responses to government benefits being negligible. What this means, and you'll see this in the book, uh, there's, there's an argument out there that that people just want to go collect money because it's available. But they've done research on this and their findings for the most part. Uh, the next uh, uh, quote here is, most people are in poverty today because of the nature of the economic system and job opportunities. <clears throat> and we're going to start drilling down to the current county examples here in a minute. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis just had a, uh, a meeting, <clears throat> and these are two of the, uh, the key players in that meeting, and a couple of data points that came out of that meeting. Uh, one is 40.4% of the U.S. workforce is now made up of contingent workers uh, with the biggest growth in part-time jobs. And the obvious implication of that, which is also touched on it to a great deal in the book, is uh, if you're working part-time, it's, it's hard to raise a family and it's hard to feed that family in many cases. Uh, and then the other side here, you'll see that uh, on the right, income volatility, reliance on non-traditional financial services uh, at a great cost, and $141 billion annually spent on fees and interest in the alternative financial services, the non-bank marketplace. These are those payday lenders that you see and what happens is, uh, I, I took the time to add up some of these programs that were mentioned in the book and others. Uh, EITC is the Earned Income Tax Credit. You have to uh, work to get that. Uh, SNAP is Supplemental Nutrition. Uh, that's that, it used to be called food stamps. <clears throat> WIC is something that we do at our agency, women, infants, and children. Provide a lot of services through that and food. Uh, TANF is the old, uh, well, the new old welfare system, and it's, uh, it's what's left of the old welfare system. <clears throat> CSBG is something we deal with in our agency. It's, the, uh, it's, it's basically the war on poverty money that began in the 60s, the mid-60s, and has continued since then, uh, albeit at a, a lesser amount of funding, but still... It's there, so I added that in. And then we also deal with Head Start, which is increasingly important, uh, education for children between 
newborn and four years old. <clears throat> and that all adds up to about $160 billion a year. That, all that assistance from the federal government, roughly. I mean, this is an armchair analysis by me, but compare that to the $141 billion that's spent yearly on fees for banking outside of the traditional banking system. Interesting. <laughs> now, I threw in here at the bottom an increase in food insecurity because I am on the current Food Policy Council, and we are trying to get the word out that uh, we need to improve nutrition quality for food for everyone, but specifically for folks that are experiencing poverty. There's a lot of health implications, and it's wonderful to see uh, all the nursing students here tonight. So the, we don't ignore that. We definitely pay attention to those, those issues. <clears throat> this is an example of uh, information about the percent of the food source individuals in low-income households um, where, they, where they can, uh, it basically it shows the, uh, the darker part of the graph uh, is food insecurity. Uh, I threw this together because this is something our agency and other agencies have provided in the past. It's the pounds of food uh, distributed by Community Action Partnership as well as the Golden Empire Gleaners. These are the two big food distributors in the county. Uh, there are many, many others, but they're much smaller in scale. And we are embarking upon a mission to gather those numbers so we can add those into this. Uh, <clears throat> but the reason this is important is because the book uh, talks about, in the early part of the book, it talks about uh, this being an anecdotal way, anecdotal evidence of a serious problem. And it also supports the notion that there are a lot of people who are living in sub-extreme uh, poverty. The increase in the amount of food that's distributed can be seen here from 2012 to 2017. I just added that number today. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's an incredible increase. So people do need the resource and uh, we're striving to keep providing the resources they need. And we're also adding in fresh produce at a much higher rate than we used to. Uh, so gone are the days where we're handing out you know, junk food. We're trying to make it a more evenly balanced meal product. <clears throat> okay, extreme poverty. In the book, they talk about the U.S. Census, and there is a, uh, a table at the U.S. Census that you can obtain data from, and that's what this is. What it shows is uh, the percentage of people living at 50% of the poverty level or less. That's the, that's the most you can drill down in the U.S. Census. The uh, author went the extra step of going to some very detailed analysis of very detailed reports to get down to the $2 a day numbers. But on this, you'll see that the areas in red are the highest percentage of people living in 50% poverty or less. And you keep an, try to remember these general locations. This is an Oildale uh, block group, census tract areas. Uh, actually, this map shows census tracts. But these red areas, you'll see a, a, a theme happening here in a minute, as well as this area. This is Stockdale in California, the corner, southeast corner. Okay, this map was generated uh, a few years ago. <clears throat> we wanted to see where the money was in the Bakersfield area. And green means cash. Red means no cash. I tried to make it simplified that way so that when you look at it, you can tell what's going on. 99, right down the middle. Wow. Now you hear a lot about segregation, economic segregation. There it is. <laughs> Can't get any clearer than that. And, bef and don't think this is unique to, ba to Bakersfield or Kern County. The entire country is experiencing this. And there, someone actually went to the trouble of mapping the entire United States like this. And you can zoom into any city, big city in the country pretty much, and, and see divisions like this. So it's not something unique to us at all. 
Just to give you an idea what this means, the thick red line that surrounds this red area represents 100 and roughly 22,759 or 709 people living in poverty. 46% of those people live in poverty in that red area. Now over here on the green side, that's surrounded by the black thick line, 7% poverty in all those neighborhoods combined with the same population. So you've got 122,000 people on the west side of 99, 7% poverty, 122,000 people on the east side, roughly 46% poverty. And then everybody in between is kind of in a middle area. I threw a few other maps on here that I can go through quickly, uh, just to give you an example of some of the other issues that are involved. Thanks, perfect. <clears throat> uh, this is from the Food Research Action Center. And what you're seeing here is those that are eligible uh, for free and reduced meals. And again, 99 is right down the middle. Green is, yes, they're eligible. Gray, not so much. This is a, a language map. This is, this is interesting. We just did this uh, about a year ago. We have a partnership with Feeding America and they're the largest food distribution organization in the country. And each of our sites, we mapped each of our distribution sites, these green circles are all of our uh, pantry sites where we, we, uh, we provide food weekly, monthly. And then we took the green bar represents the amount of food that we provide in that census tract and compared it to the amount of food that is, is needed using the Feeding America analysis. So some census tracts we provide more food than is needed, but others we don't. So now we have a much better understanding of where the food's needed and where we can distribute. And this is an occupied housing and rental map same thing, you'll see a theme, east side of 99, uh, mostly rental units. This map has a lot to do with what's in the book. <laughs> this might be the most important map here for this book. This book is filled with examples of people living in homes with five, six, seven, eight, ten people. And this, this map represents the red red areas represents 12 to 20, I think 25, I can't read it, 25 or 26% of the households, occupants, uh, households have seven or more residents. So these are households that are filled with people in an area that's high rental, um, and there are many other things. If I were to throw a lead map up here, homes built before 1985 or 1980, same thing, dark red right in this area. So there's all sorts of data that you can, you can do this division down 99. These are just some examples. But this is where you'll find people doubling up, tripling up, families doubling up, tripling up in households. Um, this is an older map. I don't know, I'm almost, I'm, I have 30 seconds. Uh, older map with uh, grocery stores shown. I threw this dark line in to represent 99 because it wasn't very clear on the map. Uh, but it's gotten better actually since I did this map. We've had a few new stores, a Walmart uh, grocery store and some others that were built on the east side and some Dollar General grocery stores and the Aldi that's being built. So there's some, there's some progress being made as far as access to fresh produce, which is really what this is intended to show. And the last one is just a dot density map that shows uh, those living in poverty. Each dot is supposed to represent one family in poverty. You'll see the most concentration at California in Stockdale. That's actually also coincidentally the highest population density in the entire county. Um, a lot of apartments there. Here also you'll see clusters of poverty. And I think it's in this area where it's a, the highest block group poverty rate is 70%. 70% of the households are in poverty in the county. Okay, and that concludes what I have to do.
Okay, next we have Della Hansen. Okay, hello everybody. Okay, so I'm gonna fly through this presentation uh, pretty quickly, but um, we'll talk about things in more detail later. Um, so first of all, to just provide some, some, uh, some context here, um, I'm going to be talking about a group of people and a standard of living here that is really well above the $2 a day folks. And the reason for that is to try to provide some context for this, this discussion, this really month-long discussion we're having in our community about deep poverty. Um, the, the basis of my presentation today is a study that was done by United Ways of California, completed in 2015, that is, as you can see, titled, Struggling to Get By the Real Cost Measure in California. And what the real cost measure is, is what does it take to make ends meet? Um, I, for those of you who are data geeks, you know, you can get lost in this thing if you go to the United Ways of California website and uh, you can study it. But bottom line is we looked at what it costs, what it takes to actually make ends meet on a modest budget, with a modest budget in every county in California. And actually Kern County, as you'll see later in my presentation, is actually divided into five different zones. Um, and we looked, at, uh, we looked at what that costs uh, a family in many different ways. So, like I said, I'm gonna move real fast through this. Um, Brady already alluded to, uh, you know, the start of, of the war on poverty in 1964. Um, we'll have a quiz. Does anybody know who that man is? <laughs> um, so, you know, the war, when the war on poverty started in 1964 and in the 60s, we tried to, we tried to quantify poverty, right? Um, and so, how, we had to come up with a measure. We had, as a, as a nation, we came up with a measure of poverty. And at the time, it was pretty simple. You took what, what it cost to feed your family, multiply it by three. If you were making more than that, you weren't poor. Um, and if you were making less than that, you were poor. Um, unfortunately, that's still the standard. So think about your own family budget. Is food really a third of your family budget? No, it's not. And so obviously, the, what, when we hear people talking about the federal poverty line or the federal poverty level, it's a silly number. We all know it. We all know it's a silly number. It absolutely uh, does not reflect who we are, um, but it reflected who we were, perhaps, in the 60s. Not to belabor the point, but traditional poverty measures don't take into account things like geography. If you ask somebody about the, power, the federal poverty line for a family of four, it's a, you know, it's a given number. It's the same in California as it is in Mississippi. Uh, is the cost of living really the same? No. It doesn't take into account family makeup. If you have a family of four, does a family of four equal a family of four equal a family of four? Well, if it's a single mom with an infant, a toddler, and a, and a uh, child in elementary school, is that cost of living the same for that person as it is for a two-parent family with two kids in school? No. Obviously not. So we, in, in this study, we took all those things into account. Plus we took into account shifts in spending patterns that include childcare, include healthcare, housing costs, transportation costs, taxes. Yes, low income people pay taxes. Isn't that amazing? Uh, all of those things were taken into account in this study because obviously they make up much more of a household budget today than they did in 1964 when we started the war on poverty. So the United Ways of California got together and they did this, uh, they did this study. And so we, let's start with the baseline. Poverty level in Kern County at the time they, they completed the study was about 23.4%. That's 23.4% of our population falling below that, that uh, artificial poverty line. Then we factored in the real costs of housing, childcare, food, healthcare, transportation, all miscellaneous expenses, factored in the tax credits, factored in all of those things by very specific geographies. As I said, there are five different zones in, um, in Kern County. And came up with the number of those folks who are struggling here in Kern County. And it actually is more like 34%. Oop. 
Oops. Across the state of California, it came out to 3.2 million families struggling to meet their basic needs. And when I say basic needs, I'm talking about market rate rent on a two-bedroom apartment, uh, you know, basic cost of feeding your family, basic cost of taxes, all those things. We're not talking about an extravagant family budget here. So as you can see, this is how it works out for the whole state um, and Kern County. You all know where Kern County is. Um, and there are five different zones for Kern County because as Brady, as Brady's maps showed very well, you, you know where our pockets of poverty is, are. And it also costs a different amount of money to make ends meet in each of these different areas. Obviously, the, the lightest area there in the middle is Western is West Bakersfield. Um, and you have the other, the other areas, the two darker areas in the middle being East and Northeast Bakersfield. So I'm not going to go into this in a whole lot of detail, but this just gives you an example of how it was looked at. Okay, so this is an average across Kern. The real cost budget for a family of three in 2015, in, in 2015 worked out to, depending on the makeup of the family, between $30,000 and almost $500 up to $37,300. The poverty line for that same, for a family of three was just over $20,000. So you can see that you had families living at 10, up to $17,000 above the so-called poverty line who were not able to meet their family's basic needs. Yeah, I love this quote. You, it is very, it's expensive to be poor. It is very expensive to be poor. You know, poor people who are unbanked pay to cash checks, um, you know, to buy money orders so you, can pay, so you can pay your bills. More likely to rent to own furniture and, and necessities that you need for your household, and on and on and on. Um, we take advantage of people who are poor. Uh, I know we're going to talk more about this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on you know, what we should be doing about all of this, but just real quickly to get you thinking um, as, the, as the rest of the panel speaks. You know, obviously we need, we all know that education is a key. Um, we know that the share of households who fall below the real cost measure tend to be people with lower education levels. That doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. Um, Two-thirds of the householders with less than a high school education have incomes below the real cost measure. So obviously the higher you go. Now it's not equally distributed. We all know that there are still other factors that impact earning capacity and, and uh, people's ability. Um, the benefits of education are not equal. Uh, women and people of color need more education to achieve the same level of financial stability as white males. That doesn't come as a, as a big shock to anyone. We need to focus on moving households up the pay scale. Um, the fact of the matter is we must value work and we must pay a living wage to people. The overwhelming majority of, of struggling families are working. 80, uh, I think it's approximately 86% in Kern County. I brought a sheet actually that, that gives you some data on, on Kern County that you're all welcome to pick up later. Um, but when 86% of the families who fall below what it takes to make ends meet have at least one adult in, their, in the household working, we have a problem. So I was giving this presentation one day and, and uh, a local businessman said to me, oh yeah, but that's all going to be taken care of when we increase the minimum wage to $15. So this is not... This is not a super high-end evaluation of that. It's kind of what the folks at United Ways of California have described to me as a, back of the, as a uh, cocktail napkin quick uh, calculation that they did. But you can see over on, the, uh, over on the left, the folks below the poverty line, the darker blue, 12%, when you increase the poverty, the, the, I'm sorry, the minimum wage to $15 an hour, that'll drop to eight. Yes, it will help, it will help, but it, the 31% across the state of California 
who are currently below the real cost measure threshold will drop to 27% under the $15 minimum wage. So it's not the be all end all answer to the problem of people struggling in our state. Next thing we need to do is we need to invest in children. Anybody want to disagree with that? I don't think so. Um, invest in children. Head Start's a great example that, that Brady's already touched on. We have to effectively link households to the public assistance that is available. Now, the real cost measure budgets assume no public assistance. They only assume tax credits that folks have earned by working, the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit. But we have to link people who are below the level, especially people, and if you've read the book, you know how frustrating this is for many of these families who are living on $2 a day, because the, you know, the word's out. The word's out in that community. They just don't give welfare. It's just not available. We must link people. We must link people to what is available to them, to SNAP, to various programs that will help them. And once we do, because there is a lot being left on the table, and once we do, we can't go snatch it away the minute they start making something resembling a decent wage. You know, how, who hasn't heard the story? Well, I was getting such and such assistance, and then I got a raise, and all of a sudden, my subsidized childcare was taken away, or my SNAP benefit was reduced. And what happens to those folks? They tumble back down. We must keep those supports in place long enough for a family to stabilize. We don't do that in this country. And help people build assets. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, if you look around at the folks I'm talking about, certainly at the $2 a day folks, people do not have personal assets. They don't own homes. They don't have savings. We have to make it possible for folks to do that. And one of the ways we're going to do that is to connect them to the mainstream financial system so that they are not dealing with predatory lenders. <coughs> They're not dealing with predators who are offering to do their income taxes on January 2nd and give them a rapid refund that is anything but. It's a loan. Um, alone with a very, very high interest rate at that. So get those folks, get them into the mainstream financial systems where they can at least stand a fighting chance. And reduce the effective cost of housing. Uh, you know, we like to talk about Kern County as being such an affordable place here in California. But for families who are struggling to make ends meet, for families who, are fall, who have fallen below the federal poverty level, and certainly for families who are trying to get by on $2 a day, that is anything but affordable. So we have to find ways to make it possible for folks to get stable in housing. You know, incentivizing property owners uh, so that there is an incentive, because let's face, because we know it, we hear it all the time, and I'm sure Deb will talk about it more as she talks about homelessness. It is very uh, challenging to get rent, to get property owners to rent to a lot of low-income in folks. Um, continue the support for building affordable housing. We are fortunate this year in California. You know, a few years back, we lost the, um, we lost a major source of public funding for affordable housing when um, community redevelopment, when redevelopment agencies were eliminated in California. We lost a lot of affordable housing funding. This year, the California legislature finally passed a package of bills that comes up with funding for affordable housing again. So we are, it's not enough, but it is at least a start. Housing vouchers, and I'm sure Deb will talk about those. We use a lot of housing vouchers here in, I'm putting it all on you, Deb. I, I um, got it on my uh, housing vouchers will help thousands of families. It, um, and change the conversation. You know, um, we were talking here before, before we got started. Poverty is not a character flaw. Poverty is not a crime. And yet, so often, we treat people in poverty as if they are flawed and they have committed crimes. We have to bust those myths about why people are poor. 
Um, you know, it's not all about making bad decisions and not working hard enough. Uh, and we all have a role to play in that. And vote. You know, um, we've become very active in the California Association of Nonprofits. And, and um, you know, for those of you who are involved in nonprofit work, I would invite you to, to be part of that and to you know, understand what a big part nonprofits play in the economy of this state. And finally, it can't all be done in the nonprofit sector. You know, government has a significant role here. Um, yes, philanthropy is commendable. But let's remember why philanthropy has been, has, is necessary in our communities. So we'll talk more later. Thank you. Next, we have Deborah Johnson. Good evening. Well, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I know you'll all be mesmerized by my accent. I am a Wisconsin. I am from Wisconsin. I am a Packer fan, and it bum it's a bummer about. Oh, come on, Aaron Rodgers! You guys should be cheering that our our quarterback is out of commission. Aaron, <laughs> you, you know who I'm talking about. Anyway, so. Um, like I said, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I'm actually going to talk tonight kind of like on a, on a little bit different spectrum from the other panelists. And I'm coming from the nonprofit sector of a homeless veteran housing provider. And I'm going to stand up here today and disclose something I've never told anybody in public before. I am a child of poverty. Um, I grew up very poor uh, in Wisconsin. And the community that my family still lives in is the whole county is 16,000 people for the whole entire county and is the second poorest county in the state of Wisconsin. And when you grow up poor, as I did, I didn't realize how poor I was until I got in high school. Like, I didn't realize other families didn't have running water or they didn't have electricity because some, my mom and dad made kind of like a game of going over to a creek um, across the street and getting buckets of water and heating it up on the stove and that's how we took our baths. So I, I've come from that spectrum um, and I wanted to get out. Like how does somebody who grows up in extreme poverty become successful? I'm a president and CEO of a nonprofit in California. Who would have thought it? How did I get here? I joined the military. I needed to get out of where I was. I knew I couldn't do it in the environment that I was living in. And I have a long family history of military service. And so I remember my senior year in high school talking to my mom and crying that I wanted to go to college. And she said, how are you going to pay for it? You know, we can't help you. So I joined the Wisconsin Army National Guard and never looked back. Um, it has really given me an opportunity to do something in my life that I would have never dreamed of. And 21 years later, um, working for a nonprofit, working with homeless veterans, it's kind of like comes full circle. So I'm going to talk a little bit about homeless veterans and what, like, on the, kind of like the federal angle um, and how it kind of uh, boils down to here in Kern County. But before I do that, do I have any other brothers and sisters in arms in the audience? I know we have a World War II veteran that was here. Any other military service? Please stand up. Please stand up. Honor your service. We've got a couple. Thank you for your service. So talking a little bit about homeless veterans. Federally, um, Nationwide, there's 39,471 veterans that are homeless on any given night, and that constitutes 11% of the adult homeless population. The interesting part of one of the, and there's a lot of statistics that you can find on that. The, the Veterans Arena data is way different than what Brady talked about and what Della talked about and what Karen's going to talk about. And what we really want to talk about is statistics, data, um, as far as ethnicities, um, substance abuse issues, and that sort of stuff. So 45% of homeless veterans are African American or Hispanic, and that is just a very staggering number for us. 9% of them are 18 to 30 years of age, 
41% are 31 to 50, and 50% 50 are over the age of 50. And I'm going to dispel a myth right here and right now. The predominant, the, the highest number of homeless veterans are not Vietnam vets. They are Vietnam era. Our largest percentage of homeless veterans never served in combat, did not go overseas. They were veterans that served right here in country. And people ask me every time I get up and talk, why is it that population? I don't know. I wish I knew everybody, you know, if there was going to ever be a study on homeless vets, I would like to know why is it that Vietnam era veteran has had the most difficulty in getting back into society. One of the most staggering statistics about homeless veterans is 1.4 million live below the poverty level. And the VA does great stuff. You probably hear on the news all the things that the Veterans Administration is doing on homeless vets, and man, I love it, but we are not even addressing, we don't even talk about veterans that live in poverty. So we have no data. We have no data like you guys are talking about. We have nobody's studying veterans in poverty and how we help them. Our whole entire focus over the last 25 years has been veterans that are homeless or what we consider at risk. So the state of California has 9,612 homeless veterans, which makes up 24% of the nation's homeless veteran population. And that's scary. One state alone, 24% of the homeless veteran population. A little over 4,000 of them are sheltered and 5,600 are unsheltered. And what that means is they are living in places not meant for human habitation. So um, I, I would love, at one time I get up and I talk, I'm gonna give everybody a piece of paper and I'm gonna have you draw what you think a homeless veteran looks like. And you're probably gonna depict somebody with long hair, a beard, pushing a shopping cart, right? We have this visual of what they look like, but they're not. It's that guy that's sitting next to you, long, young lady, that could be a homeless vet and you don't know it. He looks like your brother, your dad. It could be your sister, your mother. It's anybody can be a homeless veteran. There's no specific look. It is not the picture that we see um, on TV or what is depicted in the media. That is not the reality. So locally in Kern County, what does homeless veterans look like? We have identified 99 veterans that are homeless here, 65 that are sheltered and unsheltered. So that sound, you know, that's not too bad. We only got 1% of the state's homeless veteran population in Kern County, but what you don't see is that at risk. Or one of the things I'm gonna talk a little bit about is the point in time count. Um, and I have flyers here. The point in time count is the most critical day that we have in the year that counts our homeless population, not just veterans, but all homeless. Um, and we're looking for volunteers through the Kern County Homeless Collaborative. So if there's anybody here that would like to take a day to, do, to be involved in that point in time count, Della's got the flyer. And Jessica, I'm doing a plug for you. Um, so what does it mean to go out and do that count? It means we're gonna, you know, from dusk to dawn, we're gonna go out and we're gonna go to the mission at Kern County, we're gonna go to the um, uh, Bakersfield Homeless Center, we're going to Alliance, we're going to California Veterans Assistance Foundation, St. Vincent de Paul, we're gonna do our sheltered count and then we're gonna hit the streets, we're gonna hit the riverbeds, we're gonna hit the underpasses, we're gonna go to, they've mapped out Kern County, and so there's teams that go out, and anybody that we believe is to be homeless, you do a survey. And it is the most incredible and heart-wrenching thing that you'll ever do in your life if you ever want to get involved in something, because the people that you meet are real, and they're honest. And they're not anyone that says, I choose to be homeless. I have never met anybody yet that has told me I'd rather be homeless um, than living in my own apartment. But one of the, like Della had talked a little bit about this, about um, being poor is not a crime. But to house somebody, we treat them like they're criminals. So if I come up to you and say, I'm going to put you in housing, but this is what I'm going to do it. You, I'm going to come into your apartment at least once a month. I'm going to go through your cupboards, your medicine cabinets, your... Um, 
refrigerator. I'm going to check to make sure you have food, that you have your medication, that it's all accounted for. I'm going to make sure that you turn in your bank statement. I'm going to scrutinize every expense that you have. Oh, you had McDonald's. Maybe you shouldn't have had McDonald's, right? You know, you bought something off the $2 menu. But that's what we do. To house you, we are going to go through every part of your personal life. And I don't think that that is right. I, I think that decency and humanity means that we give them respect because being poor or low income is not a crime. The other part, our organization, I, I told you before, 99 veterans we identified as homeless. Oh, that doesn't sound like a big number. Last year, our agency served over 750 veteran families. So how does that correlate, 99 to 750? It is people that are couch surfing that doesn't appear to be homeless. They are people that are staying with friends and family. If you read this book, and honest to Pete, I hope that you all have an opportunity. And there's a lot of information, and at times it's confusing, and then times it's very clear. And working in this field for the last 20 years, it's interesting to chronicle, like, the, you know, back to um, Reagan area, era to Clinton and all the changes in between. I can see how all of this stuff has happened. And it's really interesting how it is related to now. Like we talk about welfare is dead, that's one of the chapters. That cash aid assistance is gone, that people are relying on food stamps. But what nobody has talked about yet is people are selling food stamps for cash. A lot of people are doing it. And they're selling it, you know, like maybe a buck for $10. They're getting a pittance for that. So they would rather sell their food stamp to get cash to pay other bills than they are putting food on their tables. And that is something that we need to have an honest discussion about in our community. Um, so if you're a veteran and you're identified to be homeless, and we're, we're trying to de determine whether or not you need financial, you qualify for what's called temporary financial assistance. 20 years ago, we did something called first come, first serve. You hit my door, and I'm going to help you. But we don't do that anymore. We have created this complex system to be able to help people in need. It works, but it's complicated. Um, we have this measurement tool called a VI SPEDAT. And you do this 11-page survey, and we'll score you on your homelessness and your mental health and try morbid factors and your legal and your medical issues, and we're going to give you a score. And if you score high, we're going to help you. If you score low, we're, not, we're going to turn you away. And I, th there's a part of me that thinks that there needs to be a scale of, of assistance. You either get the assistance or you don't get the assistance based on that score. Then let's talk about your income, right? So what does the income look at? So to receive financial assistance, you have to be at 50% or below area median income. So this community area median income is $21,000 for one person, which is about $1,750 a month. That sounds like a, you know, a good amount of money to live off of. But when you break that down to 30% of that going for housing, that's $525. You tell me where in Bakersfield or Kern County you're going to find a safe, affordable unit for $525. So what do people do? They double up. They live in substandard housing. And Brady showed it perfectly on that map. Where we place house, veterans into housing or just low-income people in housing, it's on the red, red area. It's east of the 99. That's where the housing units are, and that just contributed, contributes to more poverty because we're putting poor people in poor areas, and, and that's not okay. So I was telling you about a VI, uh, the VI SPDAT. You get a screening tool. You get placed on, now we're going to put you on a prioritization list in the community. And then we're going to try to match you to housing. So what used to be this first come, first serve is now you get categorized, you get put on a list, where all the service providers are going to have a weekly conference call, and we're going to determine where you are on that list and try to match you to housing. It is complicated, and sometimes it's time consuming. And as a service provider, that's one of the hardest things that you have when you have a family of four, five, six. And actually, we just put a veteran um, family into housing, eight people in their household. We just got them, put them into housing. 
So we've got a family of eight. Oh, look at two minutes, and I'm not even at the bottom of my page. Anyway, so it's complicated how we get to house people. And this isn't just the veteran arena. This is all, um, this is everybody in Kern County. And Jessica, my goodness, has done a great job stepping into this role. She's a rock star and un is understanding with the complexity. Raise your hand over there. There she is. Um, if you don't know her, you need to get to know her. She works for the United Way, and she's our homelessness project manager. And she's the one that fields the phone calls from the people that don't like what we're doing because they think that they should be um, housed first. So the VI SPDAT, it's, it's a great tool, but again, it, it gets to be comp a little complicated. And a couple other things that I want to touch on before he boots me off the stage. Subsidized housing has changed. What used to be, if you are a family of four, you qualify for a one-bedroom unit. Your living room is considered a bedroom. So a family of four doesn't get to live in a two-bedroom apartment anymore. They get to live in a one-bedroom unit and the, the couch or you get hide beds or whatever to put in the living room. And we, we don't like that. We would like to see that changed. The other thing um, that our agency has kind of steered toward, it's this, it's an honest conversation and it's a hard conversation called the honest budget. And if you're reading the book a little bit, they, it talks about like what other methods people use to get cash assistance. So donating plasma, um, I think is one of the big topics in the book. But you know, there's a big one in this community nobody talks about, prostitution. We have an honest conversation with the veterans, whether it's male or female, did you participate in prostitution for money? That's considered income. And we put it in the honest budget because we don't want them to feel like this is negative. It is a way for them to make ends meet, right? The other thing we were talking about, I talked a little bit about selling food stamps, selling plasma, drug dealing. Are you a part, do you deal drugs? Do you pot, meth, whatever, spice? We talk about that an honest conversation about where you are getting cash into your household. And probably the most common that everybody sees is canning. I used to think that I was going to keep all of those aluminum cans and plastic bottles in my house until I filled up my car and got $18 out of it. If you can let somebody else in this community have your cans and bottles, it is not worth it in my household. I guarantee you on garbage day in your neighborhood, there's probably somebody around there pushing a shopping cart. Get with them and say, you know what, come to my house. You can have everything in my blue bin. Those are the ways that we can help our community without a penny out of our pocket. And like I said, the car load of $18 of cans and bottles, my heart feels better giving it to somebody else. One last quick thing. <laughs> Look at, he's looking at me, get off the stage. Okay, so uh, Della said that I would talk a little bit about vouchers, right? So um, the, the community gets voucher. Well, veterans in particular get a, a voucher stipend called um, a VASH voucher. It's VA-supported housing. It is a HUD voucher, but the case management support comes from the VA. And part of the challenge that we have in that is nationwide, they have put the stipulations. Every community, um, every community has to give out their vouchers in the same method. So at first... Back in 2009, when we started issuing vouchers to veterans, we want the best of the homeless to be put into permanent housing because it will make our numbers look good and it will make our projects look good. Then they went, you know, that's not really the best way to do it. So then they changed it. We're only going to um, house chronically homeless. And then there became a whole huge definition of what chronically homeless meant. But Kern County doesn't have the chronically homeless numbers. Then we're going to do women, and then we're going to do OAF, OIF veterans. And the fact that we have to prioritize who is coming through our door, we've got to find a different methodology because what is happening in Kern County, Della touched on it, what happens in Kern County is not the same as L.A. or San Diego or where I'm from, Toma, Wisconsin. It's not the same, and we shouldn't treat people the same way. So... I am finally going to leave the microphone. I have a lot to say. If you guys have any questions for me, please uh, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take both the flyers that Della and Deborah have here and put them on the table out here. So if you're walking out, you can make sure that um, you can get 
a flyer. But uh, I hope you can stay for Karen Urso is next. So Karen. Well, a lot of what um, I was going to cover has been covered um, very well. I am just uh, overwhelmed by the information that's been presented. Um, and I do encourage you to read the book and, um, because we all need to be aware of what's happening in our community because it affects us all, whether we're poor or not. And I do have some poverty rates, and I have that... Uh, silly number, you know, that's the federal poverty level, and maybe you're wondering, well, what is it for a family of four? Um, you know, a little over uh, $24,000 a year or $2,000 a month. But we all know that many, many families in Kern County live at way less than $2,000 a month, and others can't make it on more than $2,000 a month. Uh, most that we see as public health nurses are probably at below $1,000 a month. And I think it's shocking, too, that uh, over a quarter of our children are living in households that are food insecure. And what does that mean, you know, besides the statistic? It means that the family's using a strategy to try and make food last till the end of the month. So at the beginning of the month, they'll buy a large bag of rice or potatoes or ramen noodle boxes. And they'll keep those. And, and then when the food is getting scarce, they are eating uh, rice and brown gravy or potatoes and, and their ramen noodles. And I think, you know, Susan was mentioned in the book of just feeling so weak being on a diet of nothing but that um, uh, carbohydrates and, and the ramen noodles that didn't give her the nutrition she needed. So pretty soon that's becoming scarce. And then the adults stop eating so that the children can eat. And then the older children stop eating so that the younger children can eat. And then we get calls into public health nursing, I need a food basket, we're out of food. So a lot of community health nurses are here. How many of you have delivered a food basket in the last couple of weeks? Just raise your hand, yeah. So we're getting calls all the time, all the time for food basket. So thankfully, there are all these different programs that can provide some food baskets, but you can't get a food basket every week or even every month. You know, maybe it's limited to twice a year, four times a year at different programs. So um, it's more of a stopgap measure, but it is helping those families make it through. Sorry. We used to get calls, um, you know, by the end of the month, you know, like, the last few days of the month, we need a food basket. Then it became the last week of the month, and now it's about the middle of the month. 15th of the month, 13th of the month, we're out of food. So it's worsening. That's what it means um, to be poor in Kern County. And so if we have all this, if we have all this poverty and food insecurity, do we also have um, higher rates of chronic disease? And there is a lot of information out there. I've just pulled a few statistics off because we could go on all night about it, but the ones that might um, be the most interesting to you, that we do have a higher rate for uh, diabetes and hospitalizations for uncontrolled diabetes than uh, the rest of California. We are ranked worse in the state for deaths due to diabetes. That means that someone is not managing their chronic disease. Part of why we go out as public health nurses is to help with that chronic disease management um, to improve that statistic, but there's a lot more work to be done. We have a higher rate of cancer deaths than the state. We have higher rates of high blood pressure than the state. 31.7% of all adults uh, have high blood pressure, and that leads to strokes. It leads to heart disease as the heart enlarges past its capacity to pump its own blood. So with that enlarged heart, then you see um, heart attacks and premature death. Um, we are worst in the state for heart. We were worst in the state for heart disease, but we've seen improvements. So actually, our cardiac death rate has uh, decreased by half. It's been cut in half, and um, 
we're now not 58 out of 58 counties, we are 56 out of 58 counties. So that is an improvement, it, re it really is. That's something we can be proud of. Um, but what does it mean, you know, when people aren't able to manage their diseases and they're becoming disabled not when they're retired and they're out of the workforce, but they're becoming disabled with kidney disease and, and heart disease and lung disease when they still have children to support. They still need to be working. And so who takes care of the children then um, in our county? Um, they maybe are just getting screened later. They um, don't have access to health care once they find out that their blood sugar or blood pressure is abnormal. Um, you know, high blood pressure is the silent killer. And um, so we have programs out there with the hospitals. We have programs here at Cal State. Uh, that screen for these diseases and give health education, so we're addressing it, but there's a lot more to be done. Um, we have also higher infant mortality rates than the state at 6.4 deaths uh, per thousand life births in, that's deaths in the first year of life, and infant mortality rate is a great health indicator uh, of the health of a community, so uh, we're uh, needing to improve in that area and the, across the nation, the Healthy 2020 goal is to get down to six deaths per 1,000. And if you saw the um, Brady's uh, chart on where we are in the world, you know, economically, that's where we are, uh, just right above uh, Romania as far as infant mortality, uh, and, and we're about 30th among developing nations for high infant mortality rates. Sometimes that's linked to teen pregnancies that are linked to premature births, but um, you know, that's also an indicator of the health of our community. Low birth weight um, is a big predictor for the health of infants and children and as they go forward into young adults. So we, um, we do have uh, a, a rank, ranking of 45 out of 58 counties for low birth weight. So that is something that also is being addressed. Uh, we have more ER visits for asthma for children under five, the young, and for people over 65, the very old. And again, asthma is a chronic disease that can be managed. So if people have access to health care and have the means to manage their disease, then we won't see those high ER rates, and those are costly visits. Um, so imagine this, you have a child with asthma and you have the medication, they're under five, they have a nebulizer, but when you move, someone steals the nebulizer. So what do you do? Well, you're living in, in poverty. You don't have $100 to buy a new nebulizer, and Medi-Cal will only give you one per lifetime. So you find a neighbor who has one. So when your kid isn't breathing, you need to run around the neighborhood at night and find someone who has a nebulizer so that you can give your child the medicine. And if you don't find them, um, you know, then you run to the ER or to the urgent care with them. So that's, that's what it means um, when we have these high rates of chronic disease. Obesity, of course, higher rates of obesity than the state. 38.5% um, of adults are obese, and obesity is linked to type 2 diabetes, to heart disease, to asthma, to a lot of poor health outcomes. Um, the, for our um, STD rates, we're 58 out of 58 for chlamydia, 56 for gonorrhea, and uh, 56 for syphilis, and syphilis is new, and it's affecting men, women of childbearing age and infants. So babies are being born with congenital syphilis. The first time it happened a few years ago, I get a call from the NICU, and I'm a public health nursing supervisor, and she says, we have three kids with congenital syphilis. We hadn't seen that, her and I, in our entire nursing career. That just hasn't been around. Syphilis was gone, it was taken care of, and now it's coming back again. Um, it's linked to people who are substance abusers. It's linked to a lot of different things, a lot of people living in poverty, a lot of people without access to health care, maybe not the transportation, if they do have Medi-Cal to come into a clinic, and maybe not the motivation to get treated because it kind of goes away and becomes latent and you don't have symptoms. So, oh, well, there goes my water. But the, um, you know, the concern there is that, you know, we, we can do more to, um, to address our... Um, sexually transmitted disease rate. Um, but we do have lower rates for many of the foodborne illnesses and uh, tuberculosis. Since we're an agricultural county, having lower foodborne illness rates is good. Um, that's good for our economy, and that's good for all of us too. 
So it must be that people are taking care to keep their food at the right temperature, washing their hands, and listening to environmental health. It was done a great job going out and training uh, people in restaurants and people in, uh, you know, in the general public as to what is good food safety handling practices. Um, the health impacts of poverty, how does poverty affect health? I mean, we've got poverty and we've got chronic disease, but you know, do, are they linked? Well, many, many studies are showing that yes, poverty is linked, um, and some of the impacts and the reason why someone's at higher risk for having a chronic disease when they're poor than when they're not, are that they're living in substandard housing. So those might have asthma triggers, those might have holes in the wall, they might have exposed wires, all sorts of risk factors. There are fewer full service grocery stores, that's been touched on too, where you can buy fresh fruits and vegetables. Most of the corner stores that people can walk to, um, that we see in the, uh, on those maps in southeast Bakersfield or east of the 99, have um, very little uh, low fat dairy, um, and very little uh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, but lots of beer, lots of candy, cigarettes, and canned goods. So hard for people to find a way to get to the one or two markets that are springing up in, in Southeast Bakersfield. If they don't have transportation, they have to bring their kids on the bus and you know, get a, or get a ride from a friend. It's hard for them to get to markets. So there's, you know, great initiatives to get food out through the WIC offices and then through these corner markets, having them start to stock the healthy foods that people can walk to and, and purchase. And public health has gotten a lot of farmers markets out into the areas that you saw north of Bakersfield, the Oildale areas and other areas where in, in East Bakersfield where people don't usually have access to farmers markets and they can use uh, WIC vouchers and uh, food stamp money, EBT card at those uh, farmer's markets to buy right straight from uh, the farmers, um, something that is healthy for their family. Uh, low income jobs without health insurance or paid sick leave, and I skipped the unsafe parks, um, and limited opportunities for recreation, so you don't go and have your child go to a park where there's a lot of uh, people sitting around um, doing drugs or looking sketchy, so your uh, pavement might be broken, you might not have uh, sidewalks to walk on, so people don't have a chance to have a healthy active lifestyle. They can't tell their kids go out and play. You've had enough TV. It's not safe to go out and play. Um, lack of transportation. Uh, people pay for these rides. You know, they, they're selling food stamps for, you know, a, a loss. But also, if you want to go from Taft into Bakersfield, someone's going to charge you $20. You know, and it probably doesn't cost them $20 to make the drive. But, you know, what can you do? It, it's expensive to be poor. I love that quote. Um, Lack of childcare, so how do you get to take care of your own health? Uh, you, you don't have anyone to watch the kids while you go to the doctor, while you take care of your chronic illness. Um, increased levels of stress just lead to um, increased levels of cortisol, and um, you know, that leads to the fight or flight response and inflammation and chronic disease. So those levels of stress um, can, um, affect people in their childhood and the, the effects of chronic childhood stress um, last into adulthood, even if you get out of poverty. So it's a lasting effect when you grow up in a neighborhood um, with high levels of stress due to violence, family violence, um, and deprivation. Uh, they have late uh, prenatal care, less access to health care, so they might get their first prenatal visit uh, a couple weeks before they deliver. Uh, so, they yeah, have two minutes, good. And they have exposure uh, to more environmental toxins as well uh, because of their housing situation and just because of, you know, uh, industries that pollute are often located in low-income na um, neighborhoods. So are there health impacts for adults? Yes, both lower food security and poverty are associated with all of these chronic diseases in adults. So there have been studies by the um, Urban Institute and the Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, several reports uh, found um, that all of the, the indicators that they were looking at were increased if you live in poverty. And that's uh, accounting for educate differences in education level and um, race as well. So if you're a poor person in a certain race, you'll have poorer health than a rich person in a certain race. So although there are racial disparities, uh, poverty just seems to be the strongest driver of poor health outcomes. And on children, 
more asthma, anemia, lead poisoning from the older housing or from people bringing lead home from the work that they do, more likely to have accidents and injuries, mental health problems, developmental problems, learning problems. Um, we've already touched on the exposures to pollution and lead is one of those that's key here. We have a lead program that picks up on elevated le levels all the time in children and then deals with it. And the scary thing is that these health impacts of poverty on children persist into adolescence and they persist into adulthood. So it's important to address childhood poverty. It's just so important. Um, we've, if you've been reading the Bakersfield, California, they talked a lot about toxic effects and they've talked about um, adverse childhood events. So these are linked to poor uh, psychological and physical health. And those, again, persist into adulthood. Um, people who are in poverty are less likely to be insured or to have a medical home. That means a place where they go to get these diseases taken care of so they don't have to go to the ER all the time. Um, the cost of diabetes, the cost of asthma, look at those two. How many billions of dollars in the entire U.S. are spent on those two diseases? And if you look at costs of hospitalization here in Kern County, tens of thousands of dollars go into every hospitalization um, for someone who has a chronic disease and that hospitalization may have been prevented. So it's not something that had to happen. They don't have to uh, develop renal disease. They don't have to have an amputation. But many people living in poverty think that if you have diabetes, that is your lot in life. You are gonna have an amputation and you're gonna have kidney disease. It doesn't have to be or you aren't gonna be able to play sports, or you're gonna have problems with your lungs if you have asthma. No, you can live healthy with asthma. And um, these are direct costs, remember not the missed school days, so the schools take in more money or, uh, by numbers of children in school, so if children are missing to asthma, it affects the schools, it affects um, work because uh, parents have to stay home with children, or, the, or because of their own chronic illness, they're not working. So this isn't even counting the indirect cost. Um, and I wanted to say I, there's a lot being done. Welfare is not de dead in Kern County. If you go into the office on the corner of Union and California into the Department of Human Services, you'll see a bustling lobby with people who are uh, there to help people sign up for homeless assistance, food stamps, and um, work, welfare to work program and cash aid. So it's not dead. It's really helping a lot of people, but it doesn't lift them above a poverty level and it doesn't lift them up to where they can make the real cost. They are still living in poverty. But without that, I don't know what they would be doing. They need um, those assistant, those, th that assistance. And they help people find jobs too through the Career Service Center and um, all sorts of dress for success, interview help, resume help. They give a lot of help to people. Um, there are all these different agencies that are providing programs. Uh, visitation programs, screening programs, uh, mentoring programs for people who are living in poverty. And um, I think they're just, what we have to do is to look at them and say, well, how can we support them? You know, they're the ones that are on the front lines. They're doing a great job. Um, they are working tirelessly and they're seeing that their budgets are being cut. They're seeing that money is going away, but they don't give up. They just keep on working. And so I think one thing that we can do is to just um, continue to support um, all the work that's being done in our community and what more can be done. I think a lot of these terms have already been um, used, you know, eliminating childhood poverty, us, um, addressing poverty as a public health problem, because that's what it is. It's not just an economic problem. Um, make sure that we are strengthening families and, um, and that we are strengthening neighborhoods so that um, people can use the resources that they've developed living in poverty to become self-sufficient because they have those resources and they want to work, and they want to be successful, and they want to see their kids successful. So I think one thing we can do is help them help themselves as much as we can. Thank you.
So before we begin the question and answer session, I want to thank all of our panelists here again for their presentations tonight. So thank you. So I know I have. I know people. There's people who need to leave. I know some of my students too, telling me about things they need, to, how long they can stay. So I understand some people need to go. Um, we'll start question answer here. Um, so the session is going to go till nine o'clock tonight. So we've got about half an hour for questions. Uh, if you have a question, you can raise raise your hand. I'll call on people for questions. Uh, please stand up if you have a question. Um, or when you're asking your question, and please be brief too. I think they'll, we'll have a bunch of questions for, for our panelists tonight. So, questions? Yes. Right, right. And so um, if you think about the agencies that are there, there are probably people who are um, needing advocacy on their behalf. So at current Public Health Services Department, we have a public health nursing uh, force that is active because uh, the leaders there have kept um, nurses going out into the community to help families. But there are many counties around us who have no public health nurses. They cut them right away. So I think part of it is advocating um, and voting on policies that would help raise people out of poverty. Part of that is voting that personnel stay in programs so that you know, they don't have fewer social workers, they have more social workers in CalWORKs. So they don't have fewer um, uh, dollars for Meals on Wheels or fewer dollars for um, WIC, they have more. In essence, then, what you're saying is that we are going to vote for higher taxes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. how is that going to work? How, what, how do we get to that point? Right. And I, I well, any I, of you can. No, I, I think, you know, our advocacy is obviously something we need to do. Yes, we do need to vote for higher taxes. You know, people just need to accept that. Um, that's that's a reality. Um, I'm not, you know, you just have to do that. But in terms of what else can you do, you know, um, many of these programs uh, need and would welcome volunteers, especially volunteers who have skills and life experience. Um, you know, sounds mercenary. Financial support to the organizations that are providing uh, that are providing these services. But you know, your time, your talent, your treasure, as people would say, all of those things. Um, you know, I'm sure I, you know, speaking for my organization, you know, we have a lot of places where where we can put volunteers to work. I'm sure, you know, my my friends on the panel could could say the same about about theirs. It is, you know, I believe very strongly that there is a large role for government to play here. It absolutely must play a role. And I think there is a role for community to play. And communities that come together and share and take care of one another, I think, are stronger communities. Is there a list of such organizations or NGOs locally that can collect resources in the monetary or in time that, that could be put out there so that if one of us or several of mm -hmm. us have an So is this, you, you all had some information you had. Yeah, we have that information that we can um, share. I'm sorry. And um, Kern, yeah, um, when it comes to homeless folks, there's the, the Kern County Homeless Collaborative's website, as, which is endkernhomeless.org. Um, you know, whatever your interest is, you can Google it. You can call us at United Way. We'll try to connect you to something um, that that is uh, that appeals to you. I mean, any number of organizations. I'm sure would be more than happy to help you find a niche. I think that's uh, one thing that a lot of people want to know, though, what, what they can do. Is it Deb or Freddie, well, you want to speak as well of things that people can be doing? Uh, 
um, in the homeless, it's funny, about three, three weeks ago, I was on another panel with Lewis Gill from Bakersfield Homeless Center, Carlos Valdivinos. I don't know if anybody else is in here. And one of the discussions that Carlos Valdivinos with the mission had talked about was there's a lot of people that want to go out and start their own effort. And we are encouraging people to not do that. Um, because there are a lot of people going out to do food efforts. And one of the things that he had talked about is the mission at Kern County does this amazing Thanksgiving meal. And right after the meal, somebody comes along and distributes hot dogs outside the mission. And to not do that sort of work, but really find the agencies in the community that are doing work that you want to get involved with and find out how you can join forces with them or collaborate with them um, instead of branching out. Because a lot of people want to branch out and do their their own project, but there's a lot of amazing projects that need the support that Della was talking about. Um, and I do believe the nkernless.org website, it's 26 agencies that provide assistance to low income um, and homeless people in the community, and you, you find your niche. Not everybody has to be involved in the homeless veteran arena like me, but we, we have that. Um, some people want to focus on children, some people want to focus on the alliance, and, and that's amazing. So find an agency, find a passion, and just kind of like stick with that. Thank you. Brady, do you want to address that? I was just that going too? to uh, place an emphasis on volunteerism because we use uh, the volunteers that come to our agency in many different areas of the agency as in-kind match for grants. And it's a, it's a big deal to be able to have that available for larger grants. Uh, <clears throat> so that's something that's smaller. It's not, it's not such a big picture item as higher taxes, but it really helps down at the drill down level <laughs> with each agency to be able to use that as in kind. And then the other thing is Give Big Kern, I think is a pretty good, uh, yeah, the Kern Community Foundation is a great place to uh, look at the resources that are available and support every year. Yeah. Della, did you want to highlight something on here? Well, that I was, was the. Say, you know, if you look at this, Supporting programs that promote economic self-sufficiency. You know, we have volunteer income tax assistance. We do financial coaching with with families, and not just us, but a number of organizations. Uh, you know, strengthening families. There are all kinds of organizations in this community we can name for you that you know do um, coaching and and mentoring with families and with youth. And you know, there's no shortage of places for people to plug in. If you have an idea of what you want to do, um, I think any of us up here would be happy to help you find a place to do that. Great. There is a list of community coalitions, too. I was moving ahead to the reference page because of uh, Kern County Network for Children, which is on the uh, Kern County Superintendents of Schools page. So it's kern.org and slash KCNC will get you to their web page, and they list all of the community collaboratives there in every single part of Kern County, from Ridgecrest to Taft and from Delano to Arvin. So you could uh, join a collaborative or get hold of the person who is in charge of that collaborative and see how you could help. And you would be meeting with people in the community um, who know what's going on, who you know, would avoid uh, you know, handing hot dogs out after turkey dinner. So you know, it's a good place, a good place to volunteer. Another thing is if we don't pay um, money in preventive health, we pay more money in the billions spent on health care. Okay. So for every dollar spent on preventive health, uh, 4 to $14 is realized, is saved. And so there are ways that they can actually budget that negative where they have health impact bonds so someone would actually give money to a clinic system for addressing chronic illnesses, and then they would make money back out of the savings that uh, Medi-Cal agencies and other insurers would see by having healthier people and fewer hospitalizations. And so the clinic wins, the patient wins, and the investors make money off of preventive health. So there are ideas out there that would avoid uh, a, a greater, just simply tax burden, but some ideas that are being pursued uh, in Kern County and they have been successful in counties just north of us. All right, let's open it up for some more questions. Other questions for the panel up here? Yeah, go ahead. 
I told you guys that I like microphones, but <laughs> one of the things I didn't get a chance to talk about um, is like different housing initiatives. Because, you know, the book only, you know, goes up to about 2014 and some of the housing initiatives. But it, since 2012, there's been an amazing number of federally funded housing initiatives. That's amazing. And I'm going to point out Louis Medina in the room. Um, he used to work with um, actually most of the, <laughs> the agencies up here on this panel. But I remember back in 2012, Lewis and at the time Kim Elbers called and said, hey, there's this new housing project called Project Homeless Connect. L let's look at something called Housing First. And what does Housing First look like? And it's a very controversial topic. And what that means is that we're going to take a homeless person where they're at today, whether they're drugging, drinking, criminal history, we're going to put them in housing, and then we're going to provide wraparound services. And everyone thought, that's not going to work because they need to have an income to be put in housing to be stabilized first. This is never going to work. Well, guess what? It works. Housing First works. It has an 85% success rate across the country. And what's interesting, uh, 20 years ago, you saw the VA in one corner, you saw HUD in another corner. There was a new organization called uh, USICH, the United States uh, Interagency Council on Homelessness. And they all kind of like went into their individual corners and never figured out how they needed to work together on homeless issues. They all kind of worked separately. And then somehow they started pulling in. And then this grassroots organization called Community Solutions um, came in and said, we want to try these concepts. And they pulled these federal agencies in together that work together now in new, new housing in, uh, initiatives. So now we're talking about low barrier housing. We're talking about no barrier housing. We're talking about, again, you know, uh, seeing someone who's on the street actively using and telling you, you know what, uh, you're worthy of housing, let's get you there. And we're finding an 85% success rate in taking someone from homelessness into housing and keeping them there for at least 18 months. And that is huge. So we're making great strides in these new models, um, and it's amazing. And Kern County really has been at, in the forefront um, since 2012 of introducing new housing models into our community. If I can piggyback on what Deb's saying for just a second with around housing, you have to understand that when we're talking about placing people in housing, for the, uh, for the most part, we are talking about scattered site housing. We're not talking about building, you know, right. building a, a great big old development and putting all the homeless people in. We're talking about putting people in the community, which I think is really, really important. Um, the downside or the, difficult, the difficulty around that is it is extremely difficult. Um, and I think I touched on it really briefly. But it's extremely difficult to get a lot of landlords to rent to these folks. And so one of the, one of the uh, important conversations that's happening right now um, around the homeless collaborative, and you know, I mean, and it extends really to people in deep poverty across the board, is what do you have to do to incentivize landlords? Because you have to incentivize landlords to take a shot on some of these folks. And you know, I think there's more and more of that conversation happening now, but it's difficult because under the HUD rules, you can only pay, pay prevailing rent. And so we need to supplement as valuable as these federal programs are and as absolutely critical as that funding is, it cannot be the be all and end all of how we approach the issues of homelessness, of hunger, and of poverty in our community. We have to branch out beyond these programs because as Deb said earlier, you, know, you can't just take these one size fits all solutions, try them, oh they don't work here, and then you get penalized by the government because you didn't get the outcomes that they wanted because you couldn't possibly get the outcomes that they wanted because the outcomes that they wanted were designed for a community that looks nothing like yours. So we have to be willing to open up to the idea of finding other kinds of resources to supplement this work. So uh one thing I think a bunch of the panelists had touched on here is not just these kind of specific sort of solutions thinking about, but a lot of you raised issues about sort of destigmatizing poverty yeah. and thinking about things that are what our vision of a homeless veteran's like, or thinking about the kinds of ways that we treat poverty as a crime, or think of people who are living in severe poverty as 
you know, beneath others in some sorts of ways. So you've given some, I think, good suggestions of ways that people can, um, things that they can do, practical sorts of things. Um, I, I, that's a much more intangible sort of thing of getting rid of a stigmatization of kind of poverty. Are things you all would, would want to say about that, of things that we can do as a community to make that happen more? Well, it'd be nice to see an anti-NIMBY program mm -hmm. take place. And I, I know probably in this county it hasn't been as big of a deal because from my perspective, I don't see the city or county pushing the issue. Um, you saw my map where the right side was red, the left side was green, money versus no money. Yeah. Well, there's a reason that developed because people with no money were not being allowed to move into the, uh, the areas with money. And NIMBY just means not in my backyard. And then there's another one called banana. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> so anything you do to fight that, the, the better. Um, you know, and there, there are things behind NIMBYism that, economic issues. But we've gotten to the point, and that map proves it, that we're not doing anything to solve that segregation problem. So if you want to make a difference, go after NIMBY, NIMBYism. Other questions? Before I go to Brick, again, is there a question right behind you there? Yes. Nationally? Okay, so, um, I, and I'm going to talk about California Veterans Assistance Foundation. Um, I wrote this number because this is pretty staggering. So we actually run two different types of housing programs. We provide transitional housing, which is a federally funded, we get a per diem rate of $45.79 per day per veteran to put in transitional housing, and they can stay up to 24 months. So um, at the end of two years, that cost the federal government over about $33,000, a little over $33,000, to uh, get a 60% success rate from a veteran going from transitional housing to permanent housing. For the um, permanent supportive housing or housing first model, it's three to $5,000 for an 85% success rate. So if you wanna look at the impact um, th that kind of like just shows the impact because we are we are the only agency that provides a comprehensive transitional housing model um, in Kern County to the magnitude like the, the VA pays that money. So you're looking at thirty three thousand dollars for a 60 percent success rate, five thousand dollars for an eighty five percent success rate. And it, um, I would I would think that Bakersfield Homeless Center that also they do a rapid rehousing program. They probably are close to us with the three to five thousand for the 85 percent rate um, the, the chal there's a huge challenge to that though and that is supportive services supportive services ongoing supportive services to maintain someone in housing it takes case management it takes social workers it takes nursing it takes the community to keep them there but it is worth it. A private landlord will tell you if they are gonna take um, 100 applications and put them in housing, you know what their success rate is? 85%. Their success rate is no different on the ones that they screen and choose into housing than those that we're pushing in the housing first model. But as Della said, the challenge is finding a landlord willing to take a risk on putting somebody um, that maybe is actively using, maybe that's mentally ill or someone that has a criminal history into housing. But at least they know what they have and if they have case management or supportive services surrounding it, there, there is a network. So did that answer your question, kind of, sorta? Really. Oh, okay. <laughs> how, many, how many people that 85% represents nationally? Yeah. Oh. I don't know. I don't know. No, it's tens of thousands. I mean, I, yeah. I can assure you it's tens of thousands. Question but up I mean, here. An exact number I don't have off the top of my head. Okay, so I consider myself a pretty active member in the community, um, but it's some, some of the things that, some of the programs that you guys have talked about tonight, I haven't even listened, like, I haven't even heard about. So what are some of the steps that you guys have taken in order to get that necessary recognition that you need in order to get funding and also volunteers? 
I'm not sure if they heard that one in the back, but no. what steps have they taken to um, get out word about these programs that, um, that they've talked about that may not be so well known to different individuals? So, and then working with a political organization, is that a thing that they've By done? a political organization, do you mean a unit of government or a... Like Democratic Committee or... Well, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, most of us don't. I mean, you know, you have to understand, as nonprofits, we have, we, you know, don't get me wrong, we are not shy about expressing opinions on public policy. But when it comes to partisanship, we have, we have very strict rules. Um, so we tend to not... Um, we not tend. We do not affiliate ourselves with with uh, partisan organizations in that way. And I think you know. I mean, not to you know, not to sound um, artificially you know humble because none of us is. Um, you know, I I don't know that it's it's the recognition so much piece that is that important. I mean, I know these folks. We're so busy doing the work. Yeah, you know, we are really busy doing the work day in, day out. And, um, you know, so it's tough. It is tough. I will tell you, the funding landscape in this community, in this state, and in this country is shifting. Um, and, you know, I, 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 and I don't say this to denigrate anybody's programs because people are doing great work. But when you look around the community, um, you know, people like to talk about Kern as being this giving, generous community, and in many ways it is. And, and I don't think Brady would disagree with me here. You know, people love to give to the food bank, okay? People love to pull up to the food bank, unload a pickup truck, go in there, load up the shelves, do all that kind of thing. And that is fabulous and wonderful, and I would never tell anybody to stop doing that, because if a kid is hungry today, you damn sure better be feeding them tonight. But what are we doing systemically? And that's the conversation where people start to kind of glaze over. When you start talking to people about changing the systems, um, and, and we are coming together and trying to do that. Brady alluded to the Food Policy Council earlier. You know, we're looking at our whole system from the farm to the markets to the fork to the waste stream to everything in between. That's the conversation we need to be having as a community, as a local community, as I would say, as, as a county, as a state, and, and as a country, is what are we going to do to change the very system that keeps people in poverty, that pushes people into poverty, that keeps people hungry. Um, and that's a really difficult, dis that's, that's a really difficult conversation to have with people and to keep people engaged in. Because if it was easy, we would have done it by now. And we haven't done it because it is so hard. We haven't solved homelessness because it is so hard. Um, but, you know, so, I mean, yeah, trying to get more funding and, you know, we're all out there hustling money every day. Yeah. No. Is there anything that the ES voters should vote for that maybe you guys want to pass, like, at this, like, at this upcoming? Oh, I could give you a list, but. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you have a list somewhere? That I do they have can, lists. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we we absolutely want to do is, you know, and I'm not going to tell anybody who for whom they should be voting, um, but I think you need to be looking at people's voting records and are they supporting programs that are supporting, you know, supporting the people mm -hmm. we're trying to serve? Um, are they supporting programs that are going to continue public support for things like housing? Um, I had a conversation today with one of our elected representatives about, you know, the, about tax reform. You know, everybody wants to talk about tax reform right now. You know, one of the simple things that we're asking for is um, to maintain the charitable giving deduction for everyone, um, not just for people at very high income levels, because we know from the research that if you eliminate the charitable giving deduction, you're going to cost the nonprofit sector across this country 13 plus billion dollars a year. So, you know, things like that. 
Um, you just have to educate yourself, I, I think, on, on some of the, there's so much. I mean, there's so many issues coming out. But um, you know, one of the things we're really working on is, is some of those basic things that protect the sector and encourage people to give, um, as well as obviously specific programs that are near and dear to all of our hearts. I just wanted to say, like, I, I, I have the easy part in the veterans arena because it's, I mean, it's everywhere, right? You don't, you turn the TV on every day and we're talking about veterans um, in some capacity. So for me to go to a legislator, it's super easy. They're, they're going to go for veterans' rights. They're going to go for veteran stuff. So for me, doing the advocacy piece through um, the offices here, it's super easy, but it's everybody else that's, that's the challenge. Um, and there is no agency in the Homeless Collaborative that's overfunded. I, none of them, right? And it, it sounds funny, but each year um, we go after about a $5 million pot of money through the continuum of care, and we have to compete against each other whose housing project is more important, what one's better than the other. And it's a, the most horrible thing to ever have to do to say that my program is better than uh, the housing authority doing housing choice vouchers or the Bakersfield Homeless Center or uh, another agency that is equal as deserving. So one of the things that our COC I think has done a great job and it has been very difficult is to learn how that we can maximize federal and state dollars together versus um, separately. So as a, a veteran provider, I, I'm going to go after veteran money, and really none of the other nonprofits in the community are going to go after veteran money. So that they let me take that, right? That gives them an opportunity to serve more people. If CVAF takes the homeless veteran population and uses our resources, that allows the Mission at Kern County and BHC to focus on other homeless populations. And it really took a while for us to learn how to work together and be cooperative and not competitive. Um, and that sounds kind of weird, but it, it's really hard as agencies is to let's complement again, let's cooperate and not compete against our population because homeless is homeless. So let's make sure we can provide the best services um, that are out there. Karen, do you want to comment on status of any public health initiatives or things that are happening there or things people, it's a chance to say all the different things that don't have enough money and uh, so anything you want to add to that list. But. Uh, Right, and, and we're a little bit hampered because I, you know, we're not allowed as, uh, you know, government employees to really, um, you know, uh, advocate politically. But um, I think just when um, the county board of supervisors has its meetings, or when the city council has its meetings, you could be there. And when Matt Constantine, the director of uh, public health services, or uh, you know, someone for the housing authority stands up or someone for, you know, even our emergency responder stands up and says, this is what we need. You could be there and support them and you could make public comment. And so I would say getting involved in the Board of Supervisors meeting in the city council, high school districts, school districts, same way. Advocate for, you know, by being there at the meetings and standing up and making comment. Question here, Sanem. Undocumented workers or migrant workers and these poverty statistics, and what can be done about their you know, living wage? Because we're talking about raising the wages to fifteen dollars, but I doubt that they make the regular living wage, you know, minimum wage right now. So I wonder, like. Where Right, we, we do operate a migrant child care program uh, in numerous counties up and down the San Joaquin Valley. Um, we don't get we don't get as involved in the pay, so to speak, for for those families, but we do provide child care service uh, through third parties, uh, and we make the payments for them wherever they might be, uh, anywhere in the state actually, and. And that goes back to the, the whole child support, uh, through education support for children, and how important that is. And the, you know, and the research is showing that it's it's extremely important, always has. Uh, so that that's one that's one thing we do, and it affects about somewhere between two and three thousand uh, people, and around five hundred and sixty to six hundred families 
uh, and that's one of the programs that we do. But we don't, we can't, you know, we have, we're subject to the Hatch Act. I think it's the Hatch Act. I'm not mm -hmm. an expert in law, but we can't go and politic uh, or take sides in, in any of those things. But we can show neat maps that maybe will open some people's eyes and make them do the right decision, make decisions in the future. Do you want to come up here, Lewis? You, you're going to project? Yeah. So I work for the Community Foundation, and every other year we come out with a list of nonprofits called the Community Giving Guide, um, which basically is it's a very simple list. It's the name of the agency, their mission statement, and their website, so that the public can go and learn more about them. Well, we're very excited because this year, um, through a partnership with uh, EZ Media, it's going to be included inside the December issue of Bakersfield Life magazine. So for the price of $1.50, with the last Saturday uh, newspaper in November, you will get an insert which will be Bakersfield Life magazine, and that will have a listing of close to 200 community um, <coughs> nonprofits all over Kern County in the areas of arts and culture, animals and the environment, health, um, human services, and um, education and youth. And you can go ahead and, and search to your heart's content and, and, and you can choose which agency you want to support. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. So we're right about nine o'clock here. I want to remind you that we've got some information outside. You can get more there. You're welcome to ask the panelists more after we're, we're finished here tonight. But thank you all for coming and for the wonderful discussion this evening. Thank you.